Good afternoon. You're listening to Gambling with an Edge. Now here are your hosts, Bob Dancer and Richard Munchkin. Good afternoon. Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. I'm Bob Dancer. And I'm Richard Munchkin. Our guest today is Michael Shackelford, a.k.a. Wizard of Odds. He, well, actually, he, along with Richard and I, are the three people who've done this podcast the most. Uh, so, Michael was a host on this show for more than a year and a, a semi-frequent guest since then. So, welcome back, Michael Shackelford. Well, thank you very much for having me back. It's great to be here. So... Gambling 102 is a kind of reference book for various gambling games. If I'm, uh, it can be a reference book for like Kino. If you're on a Kino promotion and you don't want to figure it out yourself, uh, all the numbers are there as to what five out of five plays or what eight out of eight and what the odds are. So you can see if a given promotion is good or not. So there was a volume two of Gambling 102, actually a revised version, so they didn't call it Gambling 204, but they just called it Gambling 102 New and Updated. So it's available at Huntington Press. It's been out for a little more than a year, I guess. So, Michael, what's different about the revised version? So, yeah, thanks for asking. The revised version is green as opposed to red, and it says second edition up at the top. That makes a big difference. So, um, to try to incentivize people that already have the first edition to buy the second one, I added chapters on the following games. Crazy Four Poker, Face Up, Pie Gow Poker, High Card Flush, Mississippi Stud, Pie Gow Tiles. I expanded my coverage of sports betting to talk about um, Major League Baseball and the NBA, Texas Hold'em Bonus, Ultimate Texas Hold'em, and Video Kino. And I took out my material on Big Six, Caribbean Stud, Casino War, Let It Ride, Racetrack Betting, Sick Bow, and Texas Hold'em. So if we want to learn how best to play Casino War, we have to get the first edition. That's right. (laughs) Uh, I I don't know that that's in big demand by our audience, but um, but you might have to buy two books, folks. Yeah, so... um... Yeah, I would say that about 50% of the material in the new book, in the second edition, is new games. But I completely rewrote everything. So being the perfectionist that I am. And how much is in the book that is different from what's on the Wizard of Oz website? To be perfectly honest with you, anything in the book you can find on the website. But I think that it's nice to have something physical Say you're visiting Vegas and um, something to read on the plane. Some people just like books. Yes, I agree. I haven't, and I actually have used it for reference. All right. So if you um, sign up on the Wizard of Vegas or somewhere else, Michael sends you an email fairly regularly, monthly or so, about a variety of things. And recently he's been writing about... James Bond's movies, which involved gambling. And it had to do, not always, but largely with uh, some types of Baccarat, uh, which is different than what we play here. It's, it's similar, of course, but it seemed like James had a choice as to whether or not to take a card. And to hear the rules are pretty fixed that you, uh, you must take a card in this situation and you must not in that one. So, tell us about James Bond and Baccarat. Yeah, thanks for asking. So, I do have a weekly newsletter, and I have been going through every James Bond movie where there is a casino scene, one by one. And right now, we're almost done. We are dealing with Casino Royale over multiple newsletters. But a lot of the game, a lot of the movies show, as you said, Bond playing what looks like Baccarat. But in most of the movie, it's referred to as Chemin de Fer, and you can see that both sides seem to have free will in whether or not to draw a third card. And this may seem strange to people who are used to the way we play Baccarat here in Las Vegas. In fact, I think everywhere in the world now uh, where the rules are set in stone and you have to draw in certain situations and it's like betting on the toss of a coin. 
So um, I to try to figure out what was going on, I bought a copy of Ian Fleming's Casino Royale. And in the book, contrary to the movie, he is playing Chemin de Fer. And there is a lot of talk about the odds of it and whether or not the player should hit or stand on a, a, a total of five. But basically, in the book and in some literature, the rules are the same as Baccarat here in Las Vegas, where if either side has a natural eight or nine, that is an automatic, that automatically freezes the play. You can't draw, neither side can draw a third card. But assuming that doesn't happen, then both sides can do what they want. And the banker does get to see, does have a positional advantage to see what the player did. And if the player draws, he gets to see that third card. So um, I have done a lot of math on this, and it turns into a rock, paper, scissors kind of a situation where both sides should randomize some plays. The player who has to act first should randomize whether or not he hits or stands on a total of five, and the banker should randomize the following plays. If the player stands on a five and the banker has a six, he should randomize whether or not to hit or stand on that. If the banker also wait a hit, minute, wait a minute. Okay, you said if the pl you mean if the player draws a five. Okay, no. If the let's say that the. I mean, um, because if the oh, no, player no, 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 no. stood on five, why would he hit a six? Right. So the banker would not know what the player had. But let's say that the banker has a total of six, and he sees the player standing. That should indicate to him that the player is happy with his hand. Um, so that in that case, the, the banker should be a little bit more aggressive, and he should not be so happy with that six. It's an on-the-fence kind of situation I see. where the odds favor randomizing it, kind of like in some situations on Jeopardy. Um, and when you say randomizing, are you do you mean a do you mean fifty fifty whether he hits or stands or randomizes at what percentage? I am glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> the banker should hit that six with a probability of seventy eight point eight four percent. Uh huh. Now, doesn't this? I mean, have you done any work on any of these California games? Because I believe there is a California card room version of this game where the players are dealt two face down cards and you're trying to get a total of nine and you see the hit card. I believe there is still this version of that game in California. So I guess these numbers would apply to that game as well, right? Assuming that the rules were the same, yes, they would. Do you know the name of this game or the casino? Oh, man. You know, they, they, every one of these uh, card rooms, the banking organization, they all come up with their own versions of games and mm -hmm. call them different things. And I don't remember that particular one. I'm sure some of our listeners will be able to uh, to tell us. But, yeah, they're, they're, um, uh, they may have gone by the wayside because... I believe they have actually started dealing Baccarat now. They couldn't do that in the past. Um, and at some point, I don't know how they got around the law or the law changed and now they can have Baccarat. So maybe these types of games have gone away. Um, I haven't been there in years, so I, I'm not up to date. But Okay. I believe that while they have to do goofy things with blackjack in the L.A. area, I believe Baccarat is dealt by the conventional rules, and um, so yeah, where the where the rules about taking a third card are set in stone. Yeah, they um, one of the games was called like Lucky Nine, and then there hmm. was there were but there were many variations of this game. Um, the, the, where they were basically trying to deal Baccarat, which they weren't allowed to do at the time, but they eventually now they can so. I invite your audience to contact me if they know of the existence of any kind of free will version of Baccarat. Yeah. Okay, cool. And also, isn't um, Punto Banco, isn't that also a version of Baccarat? I think that Punto Banco is, um, I thought it was just the same thing as, as Baccarat, but the way it, the Italian word for it, but about that, I could be wrong. Hmm. I believe it I- It might be you get to put up the bank. I don't know. I'd have to go mm -hmm. uh, 
Actually, it's in that book in front of you, I'm pretty sure, but uh, rather than stop to look it up. Uh, in version one or the revised version? No, I'm talking about Scarney's Complete Guide to okay. Gambling. <laughs> well, as long as you bring that up, I do want to say that in um, if you look up Chemin de Fer in Scarney's book, he says that it's kind of a hybrid. He says there's only three situations where free will is allowed in um, Chemin de Fer, and that's a... a player total of five or the banker if if the banker has three and the player draws a nine or the banker has five and the player draws a four he says that those are the only optional situations and um whereas ian fleming clearly says that anything is allowed as long as there's no naturals and um so when i talk to old timers i always ask how was baccarat dealt like back in the 50s, and there's not too many people that were of gambling age in the 50s alive anymore, so I'm not really sure. Yeah, um, and Baccarat versus Chemin de Fer. Um, but I, I do know it was dealt in cash. They had racks, even when I got to Las Vegas, there were still places that had racks of cash on the table, and they would you know, count out $100 bills and uh-huh. pay you in cash, and mm-hmm. you would bet in cash. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a slow process. <laughs> mm-hmm. Did not know that. Yeah. I yeah, thought that's um, what chips were for. Barona um, tried to bring it back mm-hmm. uh, maybe 10 years ago, and they had one of these cash Baccarat tables, mm-hmm. uh, which, you know, if you'd never seen it, it's kind of crazy to look at with all this cash sitting on the table in these kind of little uh, dividers, you know, with the different bills. Uh, but the players didn't like it. And, you know, they, I guess it was slow and they'd rather just deal with the chips. Have you ever heard of anyone in the United States dealing Baccarat the way they do in Macau with promotional chips? Uh, no. I. Yeah. So for the benefit of your audience, in Macau, what you do is um, you, you probably bring in a suitcase full of cash. <laughs> and then they give you um, promotional chips for them, like the type that you can use until you lose them, but they will add a certain percentage that is probably going to be about half a percent. So, um, and then once, and then when you win, they pay you in real money. So eventually you're going to cycle through all that and have real money, and then you convert it back to promotional chips and again, get that extra percentage. And I think it would be so much more simple than the way they incentivize high rollers here now. And it's, it's all very mathematical and the, the casinos don't need to get a don't have to worry about being abused by, you know, someone. Well, now, so yeah. um, I, I want to say like 35 years ago, uh-huh. they brought in this Chinese host at the Barbary Coast. Uh-huh. And uh, they set up a program exactly like what you're talking about. And, but I think you were getting, I can't remember, it might have been as much as 5%. Um, it, it might have only been 2%, but, um, you know, you could use them for your odds bets on craps. Uh-huh. So we were, you you could buy 10000 at a time, and we were all just churning these, you know, $10,000 buy-ins on the crap table, um, you know, betting pass and come and full odds, or I actually don't, was slightly better. Um, and it didn't last very long. Um, but yeah, I remember sp- spending, you know, more than 24 hours, you know, uh, on a play or something, just like churning, churning these, these chips. Mm-hmm. Um, there were, of course, as you would imagine, a lot of wise guys <laughs> packed around the crap table. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, um, I, but I haven't heard of it in Vegas since then. Okay. That's, that's a good story. I didn't know that. Sometimes James Bond doesn't play the Baccarat variation. Sometimes he plays poker. Mm-hmm. Or Moonwrecker, he played bridge. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, I, actually, I only in the up, book. Did you? Did you? Uh, I haven't seen your series. Did you talk about Goldfinger in there? On yes. the golf. Um, no, I'm talking about the gin rummy, where the, the oh guy. yeah, that was that was in uh, Diamonds Are Forever. 
Well, it was also no, no, no. Go- no, you're right. You're Gold right. Finger. Goldfinger. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So he's playing gin. Goldfinger is playing gin rummy with a guy because yeah. I remember seeing this. I was like nine years old or mm-hmm. whatever, and uh, already very into cards and gambling. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, for our audience who may not have seen it, Goldfinger is playing gin out by the pool with a guy, and he's got a guy in the hotel with a telescope, seeing the guy's cards and radioing them to goldfingers yeah but it was a woman and and she got punished by getting painted in gold yeah oh yeah 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 for for helping james bond uh um ruin his play yeah and my favorite in james bond was wasn't gambling it was uh the moonraker bridge scene where they get into gambling and james bond and his partner who happened to be M, his boss, bet an enormous amount of money against these guys. And he gives the bad guy ace, king, queen, jack of one suit, ace, king, queen, jack of another suit, ace, king of a third suit, and king, jack, nine of the fourth. And James bets him that the guy will take no tricks. So, in other words, James bets seven. He's going to win all the hands. It's a, the bid was seven clubs. Now, the other guy's looking at um, basically three quarters of the points in the deck, and so he doubles. Of course, James Bond redoubles and collects on it in a clever little um, that would work against all leads. It was unbelievable unless you actually saw how they did it, but it was. Um, yeah, you've got to be a bridge player to really appreciate it. But yeah. Still. Most audiences can realize that when you start with ace, king, queen, jack of two suits and ace, king of a third and king, jack, nine of the last one, that you got a pretty good hand. Yeah. Yeah. So I believe that um, it was in the book where they were playing bridge, but um, in the the movie was completely different. And as I recall, I read this years ago, but James Bond was trying to figure out how the villain Drax was cheating. And didn't it come down to basically a mirrored cigarette case? Don't I remember haven't that. seen the movie in, okay. you know, Don't you know, remember so that. Years. Right. But, uh, yeah, other movies, I mean, other games that James Bond has been seen playing is he played Craps in Diamonds Are Forever, and he played Blackjack in um, um, not The Living Daylights, but the one that came after that, um, License to Kill. I, uh, you know, I have to say that... Um, so many movie gambling scenes in movies are just terrible. And it was one of the most frustrating things for me working on movies in situations where I was not the director, but, you know, working uh, as like the line producer or whatever. And they would have some scene. And I remember one in particular where the guy is playing Baccarat and he's like saying, hit me. <laughs> And and I tried to explain, like, this is not how you play Baccarat. And the director was just like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And I'm like, but it does. It makes the whole thing look ridiculously stupid, you mm-hmm. know. And But, you know, they it, it was incredibly frustrating. Yes, two, um, two – sorry to interrupt you. But, yeah, two frustrating scenes in James Bond gambling is one is in – not Octopussy, but For Your Eyes Only – where he is playing Chemin de Fer, and you know how they will do a cut to the table to show the cards, and it completely did not match what was being spoken. And they, with James Bond's hand, they cut to the same cards in two different scenes. Uh, completely terrible editing. And in The Living Daylights, he's playing Blackjack, and at the very beginning, he's playing a, a shoe game, six or eight decks, and then suddenly a new dealer appears, a mechanic to cheat him. And suddenly she's <laughs> dealing with different color cards in a single deck game. And James Bond never even comments about this. Um, yeah. I, I also, they would also do things like they wanted some, you know, hot young girl to play the dealer. And, you know, she would deal like like a five-year-old where you sort of grab the card with your thumb and turn it face up, like, you know, looked absolutely nothing like Mm -hmm. someone who ever even seen blackjack being dealt. 
so yeah, gambling scenes in in movies for me were uh, really uh, really frustrating to deal with. How about leaving Las Vegas? Do you know what was really ridiculous in that one? You know, I don't remember again. It's been too long since I've seen. Uh, so seen Nicolas him. Cage was playing blackjack, but he was playing at a at a Caribbean stud table. <laughs> You got a problem with that? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> but by, by the way, I also want to mention that um, you've been analyzing uh, these scenes from James Bond movies, but also uh, Sal Piacente has a video where he analyzes um, cheating scenes. Yeah, in I've seen that. That's a great video. So, yeah, yeah. So um, people may want to check. I actually, I think it was one of our recommended a couple of months ago. So. Um, and we're this close to getting him on the air to uh, yeah, to talk he's a about very it. busy guy, mm-hmm. and uh, he said he'd have some time maybe in December. So, well, December is um, is upon us. Now, did you come to an opinion, um, Michael, whether um, Sean Connery or Daniel Craig or Roger Moore or one of the others was the better gambler? I would say Daniel Craig. Uh, as much as I like the gambling scenes in the Sean Connery movies, and Diamonds Are Forever here in Las Vegas, he's playing craps and he's making, he's betting the hard ways, and I think he bets the eleven and and all these sucker bets, and uh, of course he wins. He's James Bond, but <laughs> but as someone who has been preaching to try to find the best odds that you can, these are terrible sucker bets. So. That, so I can't say that Sean, Sean Connery's James Bond is a good gambler. Now, but Daniel Craig, all we see, I believe the only gambling scene with him is in Casino Royale. And I, I'm not a poker expert, but I love that movie. And I love the whole texture to that scene. I did not pick up him doing anything really stupid. I think there were some minor flaws in the editing. Like they, they're playing in a tournament and everyone starts with a gigantic stack of chips it's my understanding that you probably are only going to have start with maybe 50 chips or so maybe you know better than me but uh but no i'm going with daniel craig well actually daniel craig did have a a, a nice move it, you know it, he, he actually fell for a trap but it was a nice move he noticed a an eye tick by the his opponent when yes, the uh, chief. it's sort of a movie trope really uh, that that you cuz you see the tale like uh Matt Damon seeing mm-hmm. John Malkovich uh open the Oreo cookie uh, mm-hmm. uh, yeah it was a false tell right yeah it was the guy was setting him up although bleeding out of the middle of your eyes doing it on command is a pretty uh, pretty <laughs> pretty clever trick <laughs> yeah i just uh, a little piece of movie trivia probably the most obscure James Bond uh, do you know who the who would I w- would consider to be the most obscure actor to play James Bond? No, um, it's either Lazenby or Niven. I would, no, I would say one. I would go with Lazenby. Uh, I would go with Woody Allen. I don't consider that a true James Bond movie. Uh, <laughs> well, it, it is a James Bond movie, right? It's the first Casino Royale. Well, I for me, a true James Bond movie was made by. Eon Productions that uh, that, okay. that had the rights, and I think that even though they're very different from one to the other, I think that I, I like their style, and um, I think that the Woody Allen Casino Royale was was more of a, a comedy, a satire. Um, while we're on the subject of movies, you wanted to make a comment about the card counter. Yes, thank you for asking. So I just want to warn everybody listening that (laughs) the movie The Card Counter is not about card counting. It's mentioned very briefly in the beginning where they spend maybe a minute explaining how card counting works, and then they never get back to it the whole rest of the movie. There is the the, uh, main character does play poker he's a professional poker player going around from one tournament to another so that gets some decent coverage but it's not the main thrust of the movie so please don't see that movie based on the title i felt a little bit deceived so i want to pass on this warning all right so since uh the wizard was deceived we're going to do some commercials now the south point has more than ten thousand gains returning at least 99 percent this is more such game than anyone else has for a few days longer through the rest of november uh you can earn walmart gift cards at half price 
up to a maximum of 10. You must redeem them by midnight, November 30th. Starting in no in December, I'm guessing, because I've not seen the mailer yet. However, in the past 10 years, in 10 of those years, uh, they've had half price almost everything. But in the interval between the end of the NFR Rodeo and Christmas Eve. So that would be using your points, half price for meals, show tickets, New Year's Eve tickets, uh, movies, bowling, bingo, what, what have you. It's a um, good time to um, spend. Uh, one recommendation on that is if you're, um, if you're a fan of Michael's, which is a, an elite gourmet restaurant, uh, albeit a bit pricey, if you go during the time between the end of the, um, the rodeo, which I think is December 11th, and uh, Christmas Eve, it's half price, at which time it is a bargain at that price. It's the same meal and service. Hey guys, this is Colin from blackjackapprenticeship.com. And if you're serious about card counting, I'd encourage you to check out the Blackjack Apprenticeship membership. It has the training tools you'll need to beat the game, like our comprehensive video course and our training suite, so you can learn each skill and virtually test yourself before ever stepping foot in a casino. It also includes the tools you'll need to succeed, like our pro betting software, casino database, results tracking software, and access to a community of like-minded advantage players to network with in our members forum and chat room software. You can find out more at blackjackapprenticeship.com. Videopoker.com is the best place to play lots of games. If you sign up for the gold membership, $8.95 a month or $79.95 a year, this allows you to get correction on many of the games. There's an additional membership called the Pro Membership, which is sold separately, $6.95 a month or $49.95 a year. Uh, listeners may play 1,000 hands for free to try it out at videopoker.com slash GWAE. The biggest advantage of this video poker software is it corrects you on both quick quads and ultimate X. If you want the gold membership, in addition to the pro membership, the price is a bit higher. With or without the gold membership, this, um, this is the only trainer that corrects you when you're wrong on every Ultimate X, triple play, and five play variation. It works on all platforms. If this is a game you play for serious money, you definitely need the pro membership. Videopoker.com slash GWAE. All right, we're back talking to the Wizard of Odds, Michael Shackelford. Uh, not so long ago, you did a a double up promotion at a local casino. What, what was that all about? Okay, I am not allowed to say some of the details per a confidentiality agreement I agreed to. However, I can say that there was a small slots only casino here in Las Vegas that had a promotion where they doubled any jackpot from, I believe, $800 to $2,000 on anything. And so I was invited to join a crew on this, and we all split wins and losses. And I'm not allowed to say the game that we played. It might not be the first one you would think of. But our goal was to try to hit a lot of jackpots over that 800 minimum and under the 1200 W2G level. And there is a, a game where if you play it right, you will hit a jackpot in that range about once an hour and based on a small bet. And that's about as much as far as I can take this without giving it away. But everybody hit about uh, 12 jackpots. It was supposed to last 24 hours starting at midnight. And, uh, but they came over the loudspeaker at about seven in the morning and said, per management decision, uh, this promotion is canceled. And they, re they redid it later, but they significantly watered down the rules to where it wasn't good anymore. But everyone had a, a good time with that one that was in on the play. So that I made about $10,000 in eight hours. So my first thought as to the game to play on that 
would have been video roulette, where you can bet with basically no risk at all on both the black and the red with so much on the green, or there are other combinations you can bet, so that every hand is going to pay you within whatever range you want. Was that of course, it becomes obvious where every hand you have to collect. Yeah, I don't think it would have lasted seven hours if you were getting a jack. Well, and also, um, I don't know that you actually can bet enough to generate it every hand. Well, you, often they have very small limits. Well, you can. Uh, you, you can certainly bet on every number, which is another way you can. And it doesn't take, um, you know, a dollar on every number. Or anyway, you can do it, and it becomes obvious. Now, was the reason you uh, was under the um, the twelve hundred dollar W two G threshold? Was that because you didn't want to deal with the taxes or the time requirement of W two Gs? For me, it was the tax requirement. Is I'm not itemizing anymore, so for me, I would I would not get that tax deduction back. And but uh, for the other people. I think they did it because they probably didn't want to be slowed down. We still had to wait to get paid um, a voucher every time we hit a jackpot. And it probably half our time was spent waiting on these vouchers because everyone had their light on and there were only so many employees running around like crazy trying to um, fill out these vouchers. But as to roulette, that would that's a very good idea. And I cannot confirm or deny if that's what we were doing. Okay. <laughs> then, um, good. Now, how much gambling are you doing these days? Yeah, sadly, not very much. I feel I'm kind of slowly fading out of the gambling world. I have, between writing for the wizard sites and private consulting and other hobbies I have, I just don't have enough time to chase an advantage play that is not going to make at least $100 an hour. So I, yeah, for 2021, I have... <laughs> I'm, I'm lazier than you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for 2021, I've hardly done any gambling at all, to be honest with you. Okay, so you still have the wizard sites, mm -hmm. and you s sold them um, a couple years ago for a nice paycheck, and were hired on as a... Um, no, to run the operation, and... Are you still planning to do that indefinitely, or are you time running out on that, or do you know? So I sold the sites in 2014, and I had a three-year agreement to stay on salary to write for the site sites, and the three years went by, and my boss and I both agreed to just keep that agreement going. I decided to cut back on the hours and get paid less, and that has been working out well, however... I feel that it's difficult to find new things to say about gambling, and I can see the end of the tunnel, shall we say. I don't want to throw out a particular year, but the time will eventually come where I stop being the wizard, I hang up my hat, and I fade into obscurity. Yeah, I mean... I when a new game comes out, you can analyze that. Mm -hmm. And I guess you can write some reviews of new online places or something. But yeah, I can. you've kind of covered everything already. Yeah, I, I love writing about new games. There's a new one at the Flamingo right now called Straight... I don't know. It's like High Card Flush, but, but it's based on straights. And so I, I wrote about that, and I, I try hard to find new games to write about or find something new to say about an old game. I don't manage the wizard sites. I am, I, would, I am just a writer for them. All the technical stuff and advertising, other people do. Because who wants to do that part anyway? Right, and I, I am, was not that good at generating revenue out of the site, so I am happy somebody else is doing that. But on the Wizard of Vegas, you're still one of the monitors. To, yep. Uh, yes, I to, absolutely am active. So, so if you want to get kicked off the Wizard of Vegas sites, you can. It can be done. It can, and it can be done quite easily. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, I hear you've been taking up magic recently. 
So, tell us something magical. Okay, I can do a magic trick for the audience. Oh, if you want. Yeah, that sounds yes. great. Yeah. All right, audience. Yeah. Magic over the radio. Magic That's, uh... over the radio. <laughs> okay, audience. I want you to think of a number, an integer between one and nine. I'm going to pause for you to do that. Okay, I hope everyone has one. One and nine inclusive? Yes, yes. Now, I want you to take that number and multiply it by nine. And whether it is a one or a two digit number, I want you to take that number from step two and add the two digits. You two with me so far? Yep. yep. Yes. Okay, now I want you to take that sum and subtract five. Uh huh. So now I want you to take that number and associate it with a letter. For example, one would be A, two would be B, three would be C, and so on. Uh huh. Everyone with me? Do you think I'm going too fast? No. Nope. Nope. Okay. Nope. And they can slow it down or pause the if they're, you know. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I want you to think of a country. Anywhere in the world, in a country, not a city, not a state, a country that begins with that, your letter. Uh huh. You two have one? Yeah. Don't tell not, me. Don't tell me. I won't tell you. Okay. And, and the first one that comes to your mind. Okay. Now I want you to think about the last letter in that country. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, take that last letter and I want you to think of an animal that begins with that letter. Uh huh. Okay. You guys have one? Does yep. Everyone in the audience have one? Does it have to be from Australia? <laughs> no. Oh. Um, um, but it often is. Okay. Now I want you to think of the last letter in your animal. Everyone have one? Good. Okay. Now I want you to think of, so I, so I just asked about a color from the last letter of the animal, right? Did no, I? Okay. No, you... Take the last letter from the animal and think of a color that begins with that letter. For example, if your color was red, excuse me, if your animal was, say, a dog, then that last letter is a G, and that would lead you to green. Okay. Okay. You guys understand? Yes. Okay. So now I want you to think of your country, your animal, and your color all at the same time. And I'm going to try to read your mind. Okay, I predict it is an orange kangaroo from Denmark. Uh huh. Was did it work? What did you guys come up with? Well, I certainly understood how you got to the. You're forced to go to to D. Mm -hmm. That that part uh, it was, it was, is fairly easy math. It was clever. So I definitely Denmark was the first country I came to. It was mixed between kangaroo and koala. Yeah, I went with koala. <laughs> and so it was not a, um, it was, it's not a slam dunk that, uh, so I actually hadn't really, even though you said it's gone, well, what should it be, koala or kangaroo? So. Um, right, it doesn't work every time. Yeah, but yeah. I will say that most people will pick kangaroo. Yes. And you get a great response when it does work from, People that don't overthink these kind of things, yeah. like we do, um, but people but, who are into games and puzzles and those yeah. kind of things are, yeah, they're always trying to figure right. it out. And they make goal. terrible audiences. Yes, <laughs> actually, um, I saw, man, I can't think of his name now. Anyway, he's a, he's a British street magician mm -hmm. that used to perform at the Link out on the street. Um, wrote a book called Phantoms of the Card Table that was. Or Phantom of the Card Table that was really excellent. Um, anyway, I saw him perform. There's a uh, thing uh, once a month in Las Vegas called Wonderground, put on by Jeff McBride, who's a world famous magician, and uh, he ha does this thing where magicians come and perform, and it's this tiny little restaurant. And anyway, he was there performing close up. And it's all magicians, almost all magicians in the audience. And uh, it was, you know, a guy, he asked the guy, basically, you know, which cup is the ball under? And of course, the guy is going to try to 
come up with not the obvious answer. And, and I remember him just shaking his head and he's, he said, you know, just never perform for other magicians. They're just assholes. <laughs> right. I actually went to um, a talk they did by Joshua Jay, who is a, a really good magician. And, and not only does he, he went through, I believe, 11 tricks and then he shows you how he did them. Oh, where and did it's, you do this? It was at a, a um, Hampton Inn in um, Henderson, I think. Oh, that Jeff McBride put on? Or... Uh, yeah, I believe so. I don't know this group very well. This is the first time I've done anything with them. But hmm. but I love that. And I think everyone in, in the audience was a magician. And um, so that, that was great. And I wish that I had like a recording of the whole thing because I would like to reproduce some of his some of his illusions, but I can't remember all the steps and details. But uh, oh, they didn't give you like a handout with uh, like notes or whatever. No, oh, oh, no, that's they odd. let people take notes, but not video. And they they let everyone who paid to go. They gave them a link to to a de- to a download for three of the illusions, but so far my link hasn't worked. Mm. Um, but that that was great, and. Um, you didn't have a cell phone in your pocket that you actually left on record. No, no. I I would have not felt good about that. Um, I think that I, I respect magic. If And if a magician asks me to not do something or to do something, I'm going to, to respect his wish and do that. And um, but, uh, but to get back to the original question, yeah, I've been um, – I've been – I've been on magic kicks before in my life, but uh, recently I have gotten back into one, and my main area of interest is mentalism, and uh, I have uh, been doing little shows for free for friends, and uh, it's it's oh, really? a lot of fun, yeah. I So it's funny, because like you, I have had periodic bouts with uh, magic, and I also sort of became most interested in mentalism just because... You know, you can have a guy on stage making cars fly around and disappear, and the audience is like, well, yeah, it's a trick. You know, you push a button. But you do the cheapest dime store mentalism effect, yeah. and it blows people's minds. Yes, and it's easy to do most of the time. Yes, yeah. Um, I ha- I have a sister-in-law that is absolutely convinced I'm a psychic, and I keep telling her it's just magic, but, you know... Yeah, it, it blows people's minds. So, Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. Mentalism is really good. Yeah. So, uh, so who's your favorite magician? Oh, you know, the guy that I like right now, it's not mentalism. It's um, I'm just blown away by this guy. Is his name Shin Lin? Or... I just saw yes. him yesterday. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Man, he is – because uh, – in the past, I was always most interested in cards because mm-hmm. I learned I got into magic because I was gambling and I wanted to try to prevent being cheated. So I wanted to kind of learn about it so that hopefully I would be able to spot someone cheating. So I was very into card magic, and he is just uh, amazing to me. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah, he has a show at the Mirage right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have not seen that show. I did see him on um, Penn and Teller's Fool Us. Fool Us, Us, yeah. And was very impressed by his performance. Did you like his performance at the Mirage, Michael? Yes, it's he's absolutely pr- perhaps the best card magician in the world. He has all kinds of awards. And so I definitely give him a lot of respect for card magic, which is very difficult to do. And... A whole 90 minutes or two hours of, of card magic might be a little too much. So he also has a mentalist that does about half the time on his show as well. Oh, Colin cool. something. Um, so, yeah, he – the mentalist, I was familiar with a lot of his tricks, but he does them in a kind of a spectacular way that um, that's, that's done quite well. But I will – in all fairness, you can – go to a less expensive mentalist show and see a lot of the same stuff. And if you had to pick a favorite magician? Yeah, that's a tough one. I don't have a overwhelming favorite off the top of my head, to be honest with you. Yeah. I, you know, the, I just want to say for people coming to Las Vegas to see shows and stuff, the other uh, person that I always recommend is uh, Matt King, who Uh. for years had the afternoon show at, 
Harris. It was cheap. He is hilarious. He is. And, yeah. yeah. Uh, Especially if you, you know, like people... plaid sports coats and suits. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Outrageously yeah. plaid. So. Um, I Very lost good. my train of thought. Yeah, he was at the Joshua J talk that I just mentioned. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So are you doing anything else in your life um, that is interesting to our audience, perhaps? I am really into uh, mountaineering. I like um, climbing a lot of the local mountains around here. A lot of it is pretty technical, what's called um, class four, but I also do class five climbing, which is where you start to need rope and all the accoutrements for safety purposes. And I like canyoneering where you're rappelling into canyons there's that are there would be no other way to get into so oh, wow. that's how i um sp- spend some of my time and try to stay in shape yeah i would think you'd have to be in pretty fantastic shape to do that very good thanks so uh, thank you for coming on the air uh we appreciate your um your visit and um i still like moon wreckers bridge scene the best but i uh so, at the end of our show, we have a recommended section. So, Richard, do you have something to recommend? I, I you know, I was, I was thinking, don't call me first because I can't remember what it was. I was because I just talked about it before we started. Now I don't remember what I was going to recommend. Did I tell you what it was? Yeah, I don't. I think that um, you couldn't. Yeah, I don't think you said before the show. I can go and maybe it'll come to you. Uh, well, you know, actually, I can recommend uh, that Wonderground uh, for people who are interested in magic once a month. Uh, it's usually the third Thursday of the month. Uh, Jeff McBride puts on this thing called Wonderground where they uh, have magicians and famous magicians are there and they have a little stage version. Then they have a little section for close up. And uh, it's kind of artsy fartsy. Sometimes there's body painting going on and belly dancing and all kinds of weird stuff. And it's a little uh, restaurant called the Olive on Sunset. So um, I don't know what's go- if there's any kind of COVID restrictions going on, if they're paused or if they're back up. But uh, you can check it out. Just Google it, Wonderground. And, uh, if it's going, check it out some Thursday. And I'm recommending a novel called Harlem Shuffle by Colson Whitehead. There are some line dances called the Harlem Shuffle. This ain't it. This is a novel set from 1958 to 1964 in the Harlem part of New York City. Most of the characters are black, although they're called Negroes in the book because that's what they were called at the time or variations of that word. Most of these characters are involved in some sort of criminal activity. The main character, Ray Carney, son of a gangster, is a mostly sometimes legitimate furniture store owner who gets dragged into a big heist. Uh, His world changes as a result of this. Um, The book includes a lot about the race riots in New York in 1964. A lot about black-white relationships from the black point of view uh, is involved. I found it absorbing, um, describing a world I know little about. Uh, Whitehead has already won two Pulitzers for the Underground Railroad and for Nickel Boys. It's possible this one could earn him a third. Michael, do you have a a recommendation? Do you have reservations about giving us a recommendation? No, I don't. I would be happy to. So I just saw the Mind Games show at the Stratosphere by mentalist Steve Banachek, and I thought this was a very good value for the money. It's in a small showroom, and when I saw it, it was only about half full. Prices are very reasonable. There's a lot of audience interaction, and you see a lot of the same tricks that Colin Cloud did with Shimlin, but here's a way to see it close to the stage, better chance to be called as a volunteer, and I like the sm- smaller venues when it comes to Magic Show, so I recommend Mind Games at the Stratosphere. You know, um, that's one of the things I was going to say about uh, when, Shin Lin when you were talking about 90 minutes of card magic. It's so much different when 
the guy is right in a close up setting where the guy is right in front of you. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I would rather see it that way than card magic up on a stage where you're far away. Yeah. Now they do have a big monitor, so you can see everything on a big screen, but you may as well, you know, watch a video of it then in that case. Yeah. Um, a couple things on that. Um, on the Illuminate show at that same casino, you can get half price tickets at Groupon. I suspect you can too for the Magic show there, since they're only selling half. the The room is only half full. It's likely you can get a better value on Groupon. And they changed the name a couple of years from Stratosphere to the Strat. Uh, but it's still in the same place, like you're going to move that tower somewhere. So uh, it's free parking, and um, and I suspect it was a good show. All right. Thank you, Michael Shackelford. Thank you, Richard. Go out and hit lots of royal flushes, everybody. Good day. <laughs>